Welcome to the Old Time Radio Hour. I'm your host, Justine Ward, and each week we bring you a classic show from radio's golden age. This week we have an original radio play by Ford Theater. Ford sponsored a high-quality one-hour show to give the best of theater and literature to mainstream America. In Father, Dear Father, they presented an original with a play written by producer Therese Lewis and Irving Pincus. Ms. Lewis went on to be producer of the soap opera As the World Turns. In this story, a runaway husband returns after 20 years abroad and interferes with his daughter's career as an influencer and her plans to marry into high society. Does that sound like the Meghan Markle story? Enjoy the Ford Theater, Father, Dear Father, first broadcast December 28, 1947, on NBC. This is the Ford Theater. An hour of radio drama presented by the Ford Motor Company, makers of Ford, Mercury, and Lincoln cars, and Ford trucks, tractors, and motor coaches. Today's play, a Ford Theater original, Father, Dear Father. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Howard Lindsay speaking, and wishing you, on behalf of the management, a peaceful new year. The management, that's a useful generality, meaning all of us here backstage. The management is grateful for your patronage during 1947, and hopeful that you will make a habit of attendance here on Sunday afternoons during 1948. Our resolution for the new year, to provide you with 52 excellent and various reasons for making the Ford Theater a weekly listening habit. We have chosen to wind up 1947 in a burst of innocent merriment entitled Father, Dear Father, by Therese Lewis and Irving Pincus. Father, Dear Father is the second play written especially for this radio theater during our first season. And we recommend it with confidence not only to the attention of listeners, but also to the consideration of motion picture producers on the lookout for new material. Radio has borrowed from the movies long enough. It's time radio started paying back its debt to the stage and screen. Here we think is a good start. Father, dear father. Our scene, New York Harbor in the late spring. And you can narrow that down to the gangplank of the Queen Elizabeth just docked and rapidly disgorging passengers on their way to customs inspection. The usual reporters are on hand. There he is. That's him, all right. The guy with the beard and the old world charm. Well, well, so this is the fabulous Benji Whitehurst. Ah, it's very flattering, very flattering indeed that you reporters still take an interest in me. Only, please, gentlemen, don't explode those flashbulbs in my face. A beard, I may point out, is a highly inflammable object. (laughs) (laughs) Mr. Whitehurst, how long is it since you went to live in Europe? I left the United States late in 1928. That's almost 20 years ago. But now I'm home, and home to stay. Whatever made you leave here in the first place, sir? Well, the New York of the 20s wasn't my dish at all. When I had to look through a peephole and whisper, I'm a friend of Joe's, in order to get a bad martini... I knew it was time to use my passport. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, that was a sad day for every city desk in town. You were always great copy. Oh, oh, come now. Haven't seen your wife in some time, have you? No. No, I haven't. Is it true you settled a million and a half dollars on her in the old days? The good old days, if I may correct you. Uh, What do you think of your daughter's engagement? My daughter's... Why, uh, I'm delighted. Absolutely delighted. You know how it is with most modern girls. Too many involvements, too few engagements. May we quote you, sir? Please do. But uh, tell me, not that I mean to pry, but uh, just whom is my daughter marrying? Ralph Brewster, Jr. He inherited the Brewster drugstore chain. Their engagement was announced last week at your place in Belden, Connecticut. The Belden house, eh? Well, glad to hear it's still in the family. What are your plans for the future, Mr. Whitehurst? Yes, where are you going from here? Where did Enoch Arden go? Home, of course. Yeah, but when Enoch Arden got home, he found his wife married to some other guy. True, true, but as for my wife and me, neither of us have ever sought a divorce. So, gentlemen, my answer still holds. In me, you see a man bound for Belden, Connecticut. I 
hope you don't mind my asking, sir, but aren't you Mr. Whitehurst? Yes, yes, I am. Now, how did you know that? Well, the beard, of course, the Hamburg hat. No. You always wore a Hamburg when you went into town from Belden. From Belden? But you must have been an extremely small boy at the time. I was. By the way, my name's Drake. Scott Drake. My father used to run the drugstore. Oh, yes. Drake's Drugs. Is it still the thriving village center? Oh, far from it. The Brewster drug chain opened up across the street and grabbed off all our business. Uh, this Brewster, I take it, is the same one who's grabbed off my daughter. Uh, yes. I read Dana was engaged to him. Oh, you know Dana. I used to. We were great friends as kids. Tell me about her. Oh, she was quite a direct sort of girl. Curious about everything, a bit stubborn, very pretty. Hey, wait a minute. I, I just saw a picture of her here in this magazine. Mm-hmm. Here you are. Look. Ah. She's engaged. She's lovely. She uses... Charmo. Well, my daughter does me proud. With or without Charmo, that's a very good face. But uh, this, uh, who is this with her? That's Ralph Brewster. He, I'm afraid, looks a little lacking in Charmo. Well, he must have something. Yeah, he'll need it. I wonder if Dana's changed much in all this time. I haven't seen her in years. Why not? Oh, after she went away to school, there wasn't any place in her life for a guy like me. Besides, her mother never did approve of our seeing each other. That's typical. Well, to a woman like Mrs. Whitehurst, I'm just small town, small potatoes. So was Liz Whitehurst when I married her, but then she got ideas. She wanted to swim rings around the social bathtub. I've never known such a change. First, she lost a sense of humor. Then she lost me. Well, according to their story, you had to go away because your health broke down. Ah, my patience broke down. Oh, the aching dullness of that life. Two months at Newport, three months at Palm Beach, six years at the opera. I bought my wife a box, but I didn't want to live in it. What finally decided you to clear out? I can recall every detail of that last night. We were in our box, as usual. Liz had come away without her opera glasses. I went home to get them and took a boat for Europe instead. Actually, I haven't seen my wife since the first act of Aida. More tea, Dana? No, thanks, Mother. I'll have another cup, Mrs. Whitehurst. Uh, two sugars and just a dash of cream. Oh, now, Ralph, as if I didn't remember. Well, some people don't. It's very irritating. New York is calling, Miss Dana, the uh, Charmo Manufacturing Company. Shall I plug the phone in here? Yes, please, Andrew. Oh, I was afraid those people would keep pestering us once we posed for their advertisement. Personally, I don't hold with that type of publicity. Not even when the proceeds go to charity. Hello? Yes, isn't it Whitehurst? Oh. Oh, I see. Well, hold the line a moment. Uh, Mother, it's about my fee for the endorsement. Don't you think they may as well make the check directly payable to St. Anne's Orphanage? Oh, but darling, I I did so hope that part of the money might go to my fund for indigent artists. Oh, I see. Hello? Well, as the money's going to be divided among several charities, I think it'll be simpler to issue the check in my name. Not at all, thank you. Goodbye. Uh, it's getting dark, and I promised to pick up Mother at the country club. Well, you'd better get cracking. Uh, I think so. I'll bring her straight back. Goodbye, dear. Goodbye. Andrew, I'm going to keep my promise. As soon as that Charmo check comes, you and Nellie will get most of it for back wages. Oh, thank you, Miss Dana. I'll, I'll tell Nellie the good news at once. Oh, but Dana, we need that money for bills, for clothes, for taxes. No, Mother. Just for my wedding. Once I'm married, there won't be any problem about... Money. You know, Ralph, we really ought to make some sense about when we want to be married. Just what I've been thinking, dear. What's your opinion, Mother? Late August, my mind's made up to it. That's when I was married. Of course, I always say July is nice, too, Mrs. Brewster. Have you anything against August, Elizabeth? Oh, no, no, I love August. Please, sir, I must ask you to wait. Wait! Nonsense! I've waited 20 years. Who's that? Sounds familiar. Liz, my dear. Benji. Oh, no. I can't believe it. Darling, here are those opera glasses you wanted. I decided to buy them in Paris. Well, in that case, the shipment was certainly delayed. And this, I presume, is my loving daughter? Well, your daughter. Uh, Benji, these are, uh, these are our house guests, Mr. and Mrs. Brewster. I mean, Mrs. Brewster and Mr. Brewster. Uh, Mr. Brewster is Mrs. Brewster's son. Unmistakably. 
How do you do, Mrs. Brewster? Mr. Brewster. Ralph, to you, sir, since Dana and I are soon to be wed. Oh, yes, I just saw a very flattering photo of you. I must say you look quite fit, Mr. Whitehurst. And what did you expect, madam? A mere eggshell of a man? Well, considering your years of ill health... Say, if this is ill health, I hardly recommend it. You must have found some miraculous new health spa. Oh, those European waters. What do they have in them? Mines, dear lady. They are still clearing them out. Benji, uh, uh, you, you planned this as a surprise, of course. Of course. Yes. Oh, Liz, it is good to see you. And you're still wearing the pearls I gave you. Uh, they were a peace offering, remember? Vividly. Oh, one night when Liz was throwing a big party. Benji, I... Uh... Let me tell it, dear. I borrowed an Armenian sword swallower from the circus, brought him home, dressed him up, and introduced him as a visiting Maharaja. Things went very well until the distinguished guest began to swallow all the cutlery. <laughs> but I thought they could only swallow one knife at a sitting. Well, uh, well, these were butter knives. Uh, speaking of sword swallowers, young man, you're quite a point killer yourself. Now, Benji. <laughs> Benji, did you uh, cross by boat? Yes, from oh. Naples. I flew there from Algeria, where I'd been visiting Akamuk Bay, Sultan of Batsi El Nero. Oh, nice fellow, Harry. A sultan, did you say? And a magnificent host as well, Mrs. Brewster. You see, in addition to all Harry's servants, he's got 20 women to look after him. 20 women? How immoral. Why? He's married to them all. Well, really, oh. sir. It occurs to me that you and Dana will probably be traveling on your honeymoon. You ought to look up, Harry. Dana and I have planned our honeymoon to combine both business and pleasure. There are 22 Brewster drugstores in 22 cities. We plan to visit each and every one. Dana, my dear, how nice for you. Always to know there's an aspirin waiting. And now, if you'll excuse me, I'll just go and change for dinner. Come in, come in. Oh, Benji, how could you? How could I what, my dear? Come back like this, without any warning. But, Liz, this is my home. You're my family. We were your family. You mean you're still irritated? After all these years... You're just as, as irresponsible as the day you went away. And you'll have to go away again. Go away? Yes, you can't stay on here, shocking and antagonizing the Brewsters, upsetting Dana. You shan't spoil her life as you spoil mine. This marriage must go through. Why? What's so special about Ralph Brewster, Jr.? Junior, indeed. I think he's permanently arrested. Ralph's a highly dependable young man, and very eligible, too. He's worth a good deal of money. Money? What's money? I gave you a million and a half myself. I'm afraid it's gone, Benji. Gone? It's been gone for years. Liz? Most of it was lost in the Depression. I've never known about money matters, so I turned over what was left to my brother to invest. Huh. It wasn't poor Henry's fault. Times were against him. I never did trust that brother of yours. It was the way he looked at you, straight in the eye. I should have known. It was no use trying to talk to you. Liz, Liz, wait a minute. Why didn't you let me know when the money was gone? I didn't feel I wanted to ask anything of you. That was a mistake. Because, you see, the Germans got everything I had when they occupied Paris. France and I went broke together. So that's why you came back? No. No, I had a great urge to be with you, Liz, to meet my grown-up daughter. You waited too long, Benji. I'm sorry. How have you and Dana managed to get along? Well, you remember I always played a good game of bridge. My winnings have helped. And we get paid for endorsing various things, recommending hotels, dressmakers, jewelers. This house is only open a few months of each year, and the rest of the time we, uh, we go wherever we're invited. Good Lord. But nobody suspects we've no money. Nobody must ever suspect Benji. Mrs. Brewster, for instance, is terribly leery of fortune hunters. A lot of girls have wanted to marry Ralph for his money. What else? You're impossible. Now finish dressing and please go quietly. I'll make your excuses downstairs. Mother told me to bring you this timetable. Oh, very gracious. There's a train to New York in just about an hour. Uh, one moment, young lady. May I ask why on earth you've chosen to marry that, uh, that portable headache? May I ask what business it is of yours? Who do you think you are to come barging in here with your 20 questions? When you walked out on us, you forfeited the right to walk back in. Well, 
That's telling me. And as for Ralph, at least when we're married, I can count on him to stick around when the going gets tough. At least my children will grow up with their father in the house. That's the usual procedure, I believe. But when I was a little girl, they used to tell me Daddy'd gone looking for Rip Van Winkle. I can't recall ever being so heartily disliked at such close range. Then move out of our range. That's all we ask. And it's certainly no problem for you. You've always taken such pride in being a rebel. Well, go and rebel somewhere else. You look like your mother when I fell in love with her. And you talk like your mother when I left her. Oh, you're impossible. You're ready, sir. The taxi's at the door. All right. You carry those bags. I'll take these. Yes, sir. It's just down this stairway. I know the house. I built it. Uh, Mrs. Whitehurst is in the drawing room with her guests, sir. And as dinner is just about to be served... Say no more. I I didn't expect a royal send-off. He's got to go straight into town for Christmas. He was trying to put up such a brave front this afternoon, but I'm afraid Benji's begun to fail rather badly. And that's always such a sad sight. Sad sight, am I? Good evening. Oh, Benji. Well, oh, I'm so sorry to hear about your condition, Mr. Whitehurst. I hope they'll be able to do something for you. Come now, good people. There's no need to distress or alarm yourselves. I've just had word of a new prescription. Typically American, I believe, and highly recommended. Oh, what are you taking? A powder, madam. I'm taking a powder. <laughs> Curtain down, house lights up, smoking in the outer lobby only. We take leave of Benji, broke and on the beach at Belden, to call on Kenneth Banghart, who speaks in no uncertain terms for the Ford Motor Company. Ken? A few months ago, a group of experts began one of the most important research jobs ever done in the automobile industry. A firm of life insurance actuaries, men whose business is estimating the life expectancy of men and women for insurance companies, did the job. In the same manner that they determine the life expectancy of human beings, they set out to determine the life expectancy of the five largest selling makes of trucks in America. They wanted to find the facts about how long a truck lasts, how much service it gives. This was the first time such a study had ever been made, and the study was based on facts, not guesses or claims. It involved an analysis of all the trucks of each make, registered each year for an eight-year period, and it covered all models of all ages. In all, the histories of almost five million trucks were studied. Out of that study have come some amazing findings. The study proved that one make of truck had a far better record for long life than the average, considerably better than that of the nearest competitor. It proved that one make of truck had a life expectancy of more than 10% greater than the average, and almost 20% greater than one of the other leading makes. The truck, which was proved to last up to 19 and 6 tenths percent longer, was the Ford truck. The study proved that Ford trucks give that much better utility, extra years of usefulness. The histories of 5 million trucks proved that Ford trucks last more than 10 percent longer than average. That Ford trucks last up to 19 and 6 tenths percent longer. That Ford trucks are saving their owners up to 19 and 6 tenths percent. That's the kind of quality and endurance you expect and get from products made by Ford. The second act of Father, Dear Father will be heard after a brief pause for station identification. Father, Dear Father, Act Two. At the end of Act One, you will recall, Benji had just been given a rapid brush by his wife and daughter, who quite definitely prefer life without father, and they hard life at that. We catch up with Benji in a taxi cab. Benji is hungry, very hungry. He has confided this urgent inner state to the taxi driver who has promised to do something about it. Oh? What's this? Benji won't eat, didn't you? This is Brewster's Drugstore, best food in town. At a drugstore? Hmm. Well, if you say so. Here. Here you are. Keep the change. Thanks. Where will I find the back 
vacuum cleaner. Electrical supply department, three aisles over on your right. Bath towel. Linen department, second aisle over. I think I'm in the wrong place. I'm looking for dinner. Dinner on your right, just past the phonograph department. Thank you. I want to take home a case of beer. Liquor department, rear the store. Ah, uh, this, I take it, is the dinner department? Just give me the order, bud, and I'll take it. Well, uh, have you any lamb chops? Only sandwiches, hot or cold, double or triple deckers, minced ham, tuna fish, grilled cheese, chicken. I'll have chicken, please. With or without dress? Without. Double or triple decker. Is there a staggering difference? Look, chum, with a double decker, we take a piece of bread, put some chicken over the top, then another piece of bread with lettuce covered with another piece of bread. On the triple decker, we put the white meat over the first piece of bread, the dark meat over the second, the lettuce over the third, with some sliced tomatoes, and... Another piece of bread. Check. Just bring me some sliced chicken with the bread on the side. But that ain't a double decker. That ain't even a sandwich. And like I said, we only serve sandwiches. Hot or cold, double or triple. Minced ham, tuna fish, grilled chicken. I'll have some eggs. Over white or rye? Over my dead body. <laughs> Hello, Scott. Why, hello, Mr. Whitehurst. How are you? Uh, see here, Scott. I'm trying to find something to eat that doesn't come on bread. Well, I'd like to help you out, but our fountain boy goes off at six. Of course, you're perfectly welcome to get behind there and shift for yourself. Splendid. Oh, that's very decent of you. There ought to be some eggs and cheese and stuff. Oh, that will do nicely. I'm a great hand with eggs, my boy. Uh, have you any garlic? I doubt it, but you better look. I'm a stranger here myself. You are? Sure, I just came back today to take over. My mother's been running the place since father died, but she's due for a rest. Hmm. Uh, what do you do when you're not here in Belden? I've been at Columbia Medical School since I came out of the Army. Oh? But I've given it up for the time being. Now, unless I can swing a loan from the bank, we'll be out of business. Mm. <laughs> and all because of that Brewster Emporium across the street. Uh, tell me, uh, do they ever stoop to filling a prescription? Well, I suppose if you know the manager or Ralph Brewster. Ah. By the way, have you met him yet? How'd you find things at home? Oh, fine, fine. Were they happy to see you? <laughs> happy, my boy. They bought it on hysteria. Then what are you doing with those suitcases? Oh, well, uh, I've got to see to some business in New York. Uh, most unexpected, but uh, there it is. Now then, I simply dice this olive, stir in the cheese, and in one moment, it's ready for the fire. Say, hey, you're an expert at this. Well, I learned in France where they know about such things. Besides, I contend that men make the best chefs in the world. My wife was always a total loss in the kitchen. And as for that arrogant daughter of mine... But you hardly know, Dana. I've seen friendlier specimens in cages. Well, maybe you ought to consider her side of this. See here. Are you in love with that girl? Well, what's that got to do with anything? Just that you're a lucky man. Losing her is the best thing that ever happened to you. What sort of a wife will she make? A girl who'd turn her own father out of the house. Ah, uh, I sort of figured it that way. <laughs> Listen. Uh, could, could that be my train? Must be. It's the last one tonight. Oh, well. That just tops a perfect day. Look here. Why don't you come on home with me? Oh, no. No, I couldn't impose. You're not. You can't do anything over the weekend. Come on, I'll take you fishing in the morning. Fishing, you say? Sure. Go ahead and cook up your little mess. I'll phone Mother to expect it. Well, a Casey would waltz with a strawberry blonde while the band played on. He waltz across the floor with the girl he adore. But... I'd like a number four combo, please, but don't melt. Melt what? Oh, you're new here, aren't you? Well, all right, just give me a hot turkey burger. That's easy. All you do is take three slices of bread. Madam, how can you? In America, apparently, bread is not only the staff of life. It's the flesh, the blood, and the sinews. The sandwich is an American institution. Where do you come from? I arrived from Europe only this morning. Oh, you don't say. Say, what's that you're cooking there? It smells yummy. It is yummy. This, my good woman, is an omelette fromage à la crème. An Olympian concoction, the very quintessence of perfection. Well, gee, I... Uh, could I have just a 
teensy wincy taste. I haven't the heart to deprive you. I never tasted anything so good in my life. Oh, my, this is wonderful. Madam, when you mm. finished your teensy weensy taste, may I please have the plate back? Mm. Oh, sorry to be late, Billy. Mm. Oh, sit right down, Blanche. Oh, I don't know what I feel like eating. Mm. Now, listen, you do as I say, Blanche. Order one of these omelets from Olympia Friends. Mm. This gentleman's just arrived from there, and he's a real gourmet. Is that so? Oh, yours looks delicious. All right, I have the same. Only put mine between three slices of bread. Scott! Hello there. Dana! Well, it's really you. And you. When did you get home? Yesterday. You know, from the back, you look just like you used to, trudging down the road with a fishing rod. Ah, oh, Scott, it's been years and years. As if I didn't know that. Come on, get in. Where can I take you? Straight ahead. My car's parked somewhere along this road. I lent it to a guy who came out fishing. Scott, I read that you were at medical school. Well, I've had to take time off, though, to come home and see to the store. But you are going back? Yes. At the moment, I don't know quite how, but somehow... Ah, oh, you must, Scott. It's what you've always wanted. I... I read that you were engaged. Yes. As a kid, you were always in such a hurry to grow up. How does it feel to be there, Dana? All right. You're going to be happy, aren't you? Of course, why not? Is that your car pulled off there to the side? Yeah, that's it. Come on down to the stream for a minute. Ah, uh, no, I'm afraid I can't. Can't you really? Or was that just a social noise? <laughs> All right, Doctor. I'll come quietly. Well, Pat's still here. Oh, and look. There's that same old elm. Mm -hmm, bowing straight from the hips. Do you remember these woods in the snow? Of course. I remember walking through them with you. Mm -hmm. So many times. Our faces frozen almost stiff. The rest of us all bundled and warm. Only nine years ago. Forever ago. Over here, Scott. What? Why, that's my father. I know. Is that whom you're meeting? Yes. Well, I think you might have told me. Good morning, Dana. Good morning. Good morning. How are they biting, Benji? They only come up to sneer at me. But what are you doing here? I thought you went into town. Miss Matrain, your father's staying with me. With you? Well, that's going to look a little odd to people. I don't know why it should. Well, to begin with... Look, uh, if you two will excuse me, I'm going to try it up there around the bend. They may be biting better. Well, uh, don't mention my name. I'll see you later. I like that boy. Let's get back to the point. Surely you realize the Brewsters think you're in New York. What of it? I'm only here for a few days. At the moment, I'm scarcely in a financial position to settle down in New York. Oh, I didn't realize you were that hard up. Look, I'm expecting a check today, and if part of it would help you, though it couldn't be much... Oh, no, my dear. But fancy you're even thinking of it. Well, it's no fun being broke. On the other hand, it doesn't necessarily interfere with one's having fun. You think not? Some of the richest people I know haven't any money. That must call for a very special formula. Sit down for a moment, can't you? You know, when you were going on four, you used to beg me to take you fishing. We often came down here together. We did? Your mother, too, the first years we were married. Liz could bait a good hook in those days. Now, they were happy times. That's why you left her. I left her, my child, when our life together became a kind of traveling circus. We were always changing clothes to go out with a lot of trained seals. I never intended marrying a mob scene. It was Liz I wanted. I see. Well, whatever she may have done then, Mother's had a rotten time these past years. Nothing's come easily. All of it's been dig, dig, dig. Now that she's getting older, she's entitled to some security. There's no such thing. How can we hope to secure ourselves against unhappiness? Or even rheumatism, for that matter. Well, to Mother, to both of us, I mean, the Brewsters do represent financial security. Your mother may have changed a good deal, but I can't believe she'd want you to marry someone you don't love. I haven't said that. No, you haven't said it. I'd better be getting her home. You're really quite a girl, aren't you? Am I? That's my impression. It's recent, I grant you, but I'd swear by it. Well, I'll tell you... You're rather a surprise yourself. Uh, 
Well, so long, Benji. Get those trout on ice. Right away. When will you be back at the store? In a little while. Girls! Girls, that's him just got out of the car. Oh, here he is. Well, good gracious, why aren't you working today? Working? We just brought our friends in to lunch, but you weren't there. And after all, our raving about those French-style omelets of yours. Now, ladies, about last night, I'd better My explain that. My sister Clara took the bus clear in from Perkins. She is that partial to egg dishes. The letdown was something awful when you weren't there. We are just starved for lunch. We haven't eaten since breakfast. Please, won't you? As a man of compassion, your hunger leaves me no choice. After you, ladies. Luncheon away. <laughs> One Brewster special, singe it. Okay, miss, what's yours? I'll have a fine herb omelet a la frante. Uh, huh? What kind of sandwich do you want? Hot or cold, double or triple, minced ham, grilled cheese, toasted Brewster burger. Brewster burger? Oh, no wonder I'm in the wrong store. Drake's is the place to be. <laughs> Benji, people are clamoring for those omelets of yours. You're a genius. Scott, you should have come to my first cooking class today. They call me professor. I'd like to feel we were permanently in business, Benji. Half the profits are yours if you'll stay on. Certainly I'll stay on. We're going to be very happy together, the egg and I. <laughs> The plain fact, Mr. Brewster, is that we're losing all our food business to Drake's. But why, Jones? They've brought in some fancy European chefs. Nobody eats sandwiches anymore. Only omelets. Then hire a man who makes omelets. I did, Mr. Brewster, but he could only make westerns. Grave matter, Jones. I'll have to take steps. Why, this thing could mushroom throughout the country. The first thing we know, people will be eating in restaurants. That will give us a little of both. In Paris, in Rome, in Istanbul, people take their meals at colorful outdoor places. Well, we'll simply set up some tables on the pavement outside. You and I, my boy, will transport the sidewalk cafe to Belden. And now, lovely ladies of Belden, having successfully blended our eggs, mushrooms, artichoke hearts, peas, tarragon, and rice, the secrets of... Uh, come in, come in. The secrets of Armelette Monte Cristo in all its mysterious goodness have been revealed to you. Are there any questions? Benji, what are you doing here? Liz and Mrs. Brewster, oh, two new students, how very nice. Mr. Whitehurst, it's obvious we're intruding. Oh, not at all. My little course is open to all. A dollar an omelette, 40 omelettes, 40 dollars. Benji, you, omelettes. Well, you always liked them, my dear, when I made them at home. I refuse to discuss this matter in public. It's intolerable. Benji, please, can't you? Can't we... Of course we can. Ladies, class is dismissed. Oh. Uh, we'll meet as usual next week when our subject will be omelette bosquets, as prepared with tomatoes and zucchini in the French Basque country. Oh, I can that's 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 way. Way. Now then, Mr. Whitehurst, there's only one thing we need to know. Are you this local cook we've been hearing about? The word cook has a somewhat feminine connotation. I prefer to think of myself as a chef, a culinary Are expert. you or are you not employed by a drugstore? Oh, indeed I am. Benji. Isn't it immense, Liz? A whole new career. And at my age, too. I consider it a profound disgrace, Mr. Whitehurst. Hmm? Shocking, shameful, and altogether inexcusable. I'll speak with you later, Elizabeth. I don't know how you can look me in the face. It's a very appealing face, my dear. I should have known you wouldn't go to New York. That was too much to expect. You've never thought of anyone but yourself. Your own selfish way of life. That's what always came first. And now Dana must pay the price for having you as her father. What's Dana got to do with this? Don't you see that you're working in such a such a menial capacity can only mean that we haven't any money? But that's right. We haven't. Oh, if you only knew how we've struggled to keep that from the Brewsters. And now to have the whole thing come out in this, this most horrible and humiliating way. Oh, I... I am sorry you're disturbed. Disturbed? Our good name is all we have left, and you, you, the head of the family, you choose to become a cook. Well, after all, is I not a murderer or a thief? I, I, I'm not even a bluebeard. You're worse, Benji Whitehurst. You've spent the past 25 years torturing one wife. <laughs> Oh, 
And I came straight to your office to tell you. But, Mother, you must be mistaken. I am never mistaken, Ralph. The man is working as a common cook at that place across the street. At Drake's? Good Lord, and our manager's been trying to hire him away. Oh, I shudder to think of the notoriety if this thing becomes public knowledge. We can't let that happen. Yes, Mr. Brewster? Get me my attorney on the wire. Right away, Mr. Brewster. Oh, just think of it, my future father-in-law, a short-order man in a drugstore. Benjamin Whitehurst must go away, far away. Definitely. It was bad enough to have him cut in on the business, but now he's endangering our family position. You must bring pressure to bear on Dana. I intend to. If her father is given to these appalling adolescent pranks, I don't foresee a very happy future. Hello, Leonard. About that Drake drugstore matter... You told me this morning you checked all possible violations. Well, recheck them. You've got to find something and find it quick. If I have to hire ten new attorneys, I'll close that restaurant. Is Mr. Drake here? You'll find him in the back room, miss. Thank you. Yes? Scott? May I come in? Dana. Why, of course. Please do. Oh, I'm glad I found you. Have you... Have you time to talk for a moment? Sure. We don't get busy till people start coming for dinner. Scott, I... Well, we've always been such friends. I... The point is, I've come to ask a favor. It matters to me more than I can say. Well, sit down. What's got you so upset? Well, I've only just found out that my father didn't go away. That he's here working for you. With me. Oh, you must see, Scott, how horribly embarrassing it is. More than that, it's serious. This this little joke of his can miscarry and mess up everything for Mother. For Mother and me, that is. And also the Brewsters. They're very rigid sort of people. And the idea that my father would get himself involved like this... Like what? Well, after all, working as a cook... Oh, I see. So what do you want me to do? Fire Benji? Oh, if only you would, Scott. That's what I came to ask. Now, let me get this straight. You know the store is out of the red for the first time in years. You know it's because of Benji. You know I'm fond of him. You know this is the best break I've ever had. And yet, knowing all this, you turn up with your little proposition and expect me to say yes, ma'am. No, I didn't expect anything. Only I had to ask. It was the only way. To what? Ralph Brewster? And you're the girl I thought was so special. About that, I... Oh, you know how I felt. That's why you came to plead this noble cause. You thought you could write your own ticket. But I'll tell you something. It seems I've had a change of heart. As of this day and hour, I'm cured. And you did it all yourself. And it's lucky for you I did come, isn't it? I don't blame Benji for staying away 20 years. But now he's back and minding his own business. Can't you leave him alone? Or have you turned into such a snob that you're trading your own father for Brewster's millions? You've certainly grown up into an awful letdown. I never would have believed anyone could change so much. All right, all right, let it go. Well, well, greetings. What's the matter, Dana? You look terrible. Did Ralph Brewster take away your aspirin? Oh, please, don't you start now. Oh, Dana, Dana, I'm sorry. What is it? It's your fault, all your fault. Well, what have I done now? Benji, I had to see you out. Well, Dana, I'll be all right, Mother. Just let me alone. Benji, you've been upsetting the child. No, Mrs. Whitehurst, I have. I'd better clear out. Well, I must say, Benji, I, I realize I've been behaving like a fool. I want you to come back home. Come and stay in the house where you belong. You mean it? You'd really like that? I would, Benji, for many reasons. And we'll manage somehow. Of course we will, my dear. The important thing now is Dana's marriage. And if you're at home, well, we can keep an eye so, on you. So, that's it. Well, it's so ridiculous, this job of yours. And that's what made all the trouble. But with Dana married, you won't have to work. Ralph Brewster will provide an allowance, is that it? Well, certainly something can be worked out. Not on your life. I've been doing pretty well on my own, Liz. This is my job, but I'm sticking with it. If you do, Benji, I've made up my mind to close the house and go to Reno. What for? Why, to get a divorce. A divorce? But, my dear, we've been married 27 years. And only lived six of them together. Uh, Dana, Dana, talk to your mother. Help me. We, we can't let her do this. Mother, really? Are you Benjamin C. Whitehurst? I am. You're in charge of that restaurant outside? I am. Okay. I got a warrant for your arrest. My arrest? For what? Violation of Ordinance 93, aiding and abetting conspiracy against the government of this village. Act two ends on an alarming query. 
What's subversive about an outdoor omelet? A word about the authors of Benji's Troubles. Therese Lewis, much better known as Terry Lewis, or as Mrs. Hubble Robinson, Jr., is a Cincinnati girl who came to New York to write for the magazines, did so with considerable success, then moved over to broadcasting and became an executive of one of radio's largest producing organizations. She wrote and edited the Helen Hayes Theater and has been the author of three screenplays. Irving Pincus, Terry's collaborator, is a native New Yorker, an Air Corps veteran, a playwright, and soon to be a Broadway producer with a play in production for spring. Once upon a time, he was my valued assistant in staging a couple of expensive musical comedies, which, fortunately, were as successful as they are easy to forget as the years go by. And that brings us, pleasantly enough, to Kenneth Banghart speaking for the Ford Motor Company. These are the days when we all start making resolutions and plans for the new year. It's an American custom and a pretty good one. And naturally, the Ford Motor Company has resolutions and plans for the new year, too. But its major resolution is not a new one. It's one that was made almost half a century ago when Henry Ford founded the company. That resolution is that Ford products shall be outstanding for their quality, dependability, and service. That Ford products shall be constantly improved and enjoyed by a constantly increasing number of people. That resolution has been kept since 1904. It will be kept in 1948. And the Ford Motor Company has plans for the new year, too. I can't tell you yet what they are, but those plans are big ones. As the new year opens, there's an atmosphere of excitement and anticipation in the Ford Motor Company. Things are happening in every department, from designing to manufacturing and sales. The Ford Motor Company is working hard and looking forward to the day when everyone who wants to buy a new Ford or Mercury or Lincoln or a new Ford truck will get it. And it's planning for the day when new millions of Americans will insist on a Ford or a Mercury or a Lincoln. As 1947 draws to a close, I'd like to send you a friendly wish and a friendly bit of advice. The wish, a very happy new year. The advice, watch Ford in 48. Father, dear Father, come home to us now. We left Father in the clutches of the law, charged with abetting conspiracy against the government of Belden, Connecticut. We returned to Belden on the following day in the morning. Scene, the dining room of the Whitehurst residence. Good morning, Mother. Is there anything about last night in the paper? Not a word. But there has to be some explanation. I've never heard such a ludicrous charge. Conspiring against the village government. What's that mean? We'll find out after breakfast. Oh, poor Benji. Mother, you look like a blueprint for a nervous breakdown. Didn't you sleep? Well, ditto. Of course, you could phone Scott Drake. He'd know why they're holding Benji. Yes, I thought of that, but I... I just can't, Mother. Besides, he wouldn't want to talk to me. Maybe he's got something there. Morning, Dana. This is Whitehurst. It's turned up a fine sunny day. Andrew? Could you tone down the volume a little? Oh, that's right. Mother's still sleeping. Yes, Mr. Brewster? Orange juice, Andrew. A uh, cereal, toast, bacon, an omelette, Andrew. This is one morning I can enjoy an omelette. Very good, sir. What makes you so rosy today? Good news. It may interest you to hear that your father spent the night in jail. We know that, Ralph. You do? Well, I hope you realize what it means. There'll be no more of Mr. Whitehurst's nonsense, at least not in this village. But what's Benji done, Ralph? Do you know? Oh, it's a rather tricky little charge, but my legal experts assure me it'll hold. Your legal experts? As a matter of fact, your father's up before the judge this very minute. Already? But it's only nine o'clock. <laughs> well, as your justice of the peace hears cases in his grocery store, he gets them out before the rush hour. Dana, I'm going down there. Do you want to come? Later. You go ahead. Yes, I think I'd better. Ralph, what did you mean about your legal experts? I'm a man of my word. I told you I'd put an end to that man's nuisance value. You had my father sent to jail. Why, you... You little drugstore dictator. But, Dana, you wanted him out of the way. You said so. Not in jail. That's going too far. Even I see that, and my ethics certainly leave a lot to be desired. Now, dear, you've been under a terrific strain, but in a few weeks we'll be married and... No, you... Ralph. It's no good. You and I are no good as a combination. I don't love you. I don't think I even like you very much. Well, that's a fine thing to say. Yes, it is a fine thing to say. Because I'm being honest for change. It's a nice feeling. I can do with it. Let's hope it grows. No, no, no. Don't get hysterical. Do you want Mother to hear you? She'll have to hear it sometime. 
The fact is, Ralph, you're well out of this. You see, we haven't a cent in the world. I was marrying you for one thing only. Your money. But the deal is off. I've decided not to sell. C. Whitehurst on the 29th day of June at 6.40 o'clock in the evening did willfully commit the crime of conspiring against the person and property of the state of Connecticut by causing a crowd to gather after sundown in the public square in violation of Ordinance 93 as drawn up by the village of Belden. <clears throat> You've heard the charge, Mr. Whitehurst. Yes, Your Honor. And it's a beauty. <laughs> no, no. I don't want any comment from you people. Hey, get on up front, Joe, and tend to the customers. Mrs. Bafey is waiting to pick up her broilers. Okay, okay. <clears throat> you plead guilty or not guilty, Mr. Whitehurst? Not guilty, Your Honor. You're in charge of that sidewalk cafe, aren't you? Yes, I am. Well, then strikes me you're the offender in this matter, and by rights ought to plead guilty. Of what, Judge Crail? Of causing a crowd to assemble after sundown in the public square. But I didn't cause them to assemble. They came of their own free will, because you set out tables for them to eat at. Is there a law against setting out tables? Well, there's this old ordinance none of us ever heard of till some city lawyer dug it up in... And... Seems it's been on the books since 1768. 1768? Yep. Dates back to before the Revolution. And so does the punishment they figured out for the offenders. But I tell you, if you lack reasonable and plead guilty, like as not, I'd suspend sentence. On condition you stop serving people on the outside. But where's the harm in that, Your Honor? Oh, now, don't go taking a big stand, Mr. Whitehurst, or you'll regret it. Uh, better let me read you this Ordinance 93. It says... Any assemblage of 15 or more persons for gathering after sundown in the public square shall be judged a conspiratory group, and the instigators thereof punished on the ducking stool in the Barnstable River by no less than 12 submersions. No, 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 none of that, none of that. Well, Mr. Whiters, you see what I mean? I reckon you're about ready to change your plea. Not at all. A preposterous law can only be shown up by its preposterous punishment. Oh, where's your sense, man? Come on now. You're going to look mighty foolish thrashing around in that river. And your village will look twice as foolish for putting me there. Not guilty, Your Honor. Well, as I see it, you are guilty. Guilty as charged. And that being so, you're forcing this sentence on yourself. Benjamin Whitehurst, I hereby... Oh, Crail, please. <laughs> May I have a few words with my husband in private? Well, you sure can, Miss Whitehurst. Court's adjourned for ten minutes. Now, did you get those broilers you ordered, Miss Bayfield? I tell you, Liz, this law is an early American antique. It should have been repealed 150 years ago. Well, let someone else put it to the test. Why must you be the one? Because unless it is repealed, Scott and I will have to close up. We make our profit on the outdoor business. But to let them do this fantastic thing, ducking in the river. It's about time I got baptized. Not at your age. Not 12 times. Oh, I'll survive. I realize, of course, that it's going to be embarrassing for you, Oh, but, but... That, that's not it, Benji. I'm worried about you. I'd like to believe that, Liz, but as your future son-in-law brought this action against me... Oh, you... You don't think Dane and I knew about it. We didn't. Not a thing. You didn't? Oh, no. Though I can't blame you for suspecting we might have. Benji, I'm so sorry about the way I've behaved. Oh, come now. My own record's nothing to be proud of. Last night, for the first time, I, I began to see your side of all this. Liz, my dear. I didn't sleep a wink. Well, it must run in the family. Neither did I. You know, Liz, a cut like the one I had ought to make that riverbed a pleasure. Judge Crail's waiting to get it over with, Benji. Have you made up your mind? Yes, Scott, I have. Well, Mr. Whiter, Your Honor, Your Honor, I was in France during the Nazi occupation. In those days, if any group of people dared to get together after curfew, their health took a sudden turn for the worse. And why did things get to that stage? Because too few citizens spoke out until it was too late. The people, the people gathered last evening at Drake's drugstore meant no harm. I see some of them here in the store today. Mr. Patrick, for example. Mr. Patrick wasn't conspiring last night. 
Mr. Patrick was eating an omelette to Lavenger. Right, that's right. But suppose he and the others actually had met to protest against some local abuse. An unscrupulous official could have clapped them into jail. By accepting punishment, I have opened your eyes to this law that's a dated museum piece. I hardly think you let it remain on the books much longer. <laughs> Scott, go home, get my morning coat, my striped trousers, and uh, pick up a bottle of champagne while you're at it. We'll make me the most important launching of the year. <laughs> Mother, look at that thing. So that's a ducking stool. Sort of like a seesaw. Oh, dear, it hardly looks safe in that river. Brrr. Somehow, Father seems a little old for these water games. Uh, Mrs. Whitehurst, I, I came as fast as I could. Scott, did you get those petitions to the mayor? To his secretary. She promised they'd go right into him. Fine, I'll go tell the others. They've all worked so hard. Dana, about last night, I, I shouldn't have laced into you like that. You meant what you said, didn't you? Well... Well, yes, I did. But I got a little carried away in saying it. You were right. Dead right. Here comes Father now. And the chief of police. All right, Mr. Whitehurst. This is it. Well, an ovation. Isn't that nice, Chief? Oh, oh. There's my wife and the mother-in-law, too, so it help. Quite a turnout. Oh, I see the students of my cooking class are here in the body. Good afternoon, ladies. Hello, Liz. Dana. Hello, Father. I brought you these blankets. You've got to bundle up in them just as soon as you come out. And I've got a bottle of brandy, Father. Splendid. Splendid. After that water, I'll need a chaser. Come on, Mr. Whitehurst. Let's get this crazy stunt done with. I guess we'd all better roll up our pants. Certainly not. I've been especially pressed for this occasion. I wish I had thought to bring my hip boots. Oh. Oh. Is the river cold? Oh. Well, I'd, uh, I'd never confuse it with the Mediterranean. Oh, oh, that's mighty cold water. Mr. Whitehurst, you're a gall darned old nuisance. I hate to give you all this trouble, Chief. Couldn't I just scuttle myself? I'm sure wish you could. Go on, get it over with, you brute. Ready with a rope, Jim. One, two, three, pull. Okay, let her go. Oh. That's enough. Pull him up. Oh, none too, too, too soon, gentlemen. They're still having winter down there. Anything you'd like me to bring you back this trip? A trout, a pickerel? Let her go again. Oh. Now what? Who do you suppose that is? Here, it's the mayor. Late as usual. Yeah. Please, please, come, come now. My friends, your petitions have been received and duly noted. But I'm afraid the law must take its course. Furthermore, I've been advised that Mr. Whitehurst practically begged to be sentenced. Herbert? Herbert. Why, Effie, what are you doing here? Herbert, what's happening in this river is a disgrace to your administration. Leaving that silly old law in effect. You ought to be ashamed. Right. Right. Effie, won't get my vote again. Effie, we'll discuss this at home. Why aren't you there now? We're having guests for dinner. There is no dinner. The cook's here, too. And here we stay. Why? Uh, let me explain, Mr. Mayor. As president of the Ladies' Auxiliary Society of Greater Belden, representing seven leading civic groups, I tell you that unless this punishment is halted at once, unless this outmoded law is repealed, half the women of Belden will challenge it in the square tonight. Now, wait a minute. If it's minute. illegal for Mr. Whitehurst to gather a few dozen people in the public square, then be prepared to arrest hundreds of us. Because we're parading there in a body. We'll line up in front of Drake's, waiting for your chief of police, and we'll wait it out till morning. Curfew shall not ring tonight. Be reasonable, I beg you. After all, I'm no tyrant. This is mass hysteria. Come along, Effie. Certainly not, Herbert. Not until you do as we say. There, you get Benji and out of that water. Ladies, join ranks. We march on building. Wait, wait, everybody. 
Chief Larkin? Yes, Mayor. Take Mr. Whitehurst off that stool. Why, the poor man might catch his death of cold. <laughs> Here, Benji, here. Wrap these around you. You must be freezing. No, 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 no. D -d 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 Don't fuss. You've got to have a hot bath and get right into bed. I'll bring your dinner up to you. Oh, sounds like a wonderful evening. You, 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 you sure I won't be in the way at your house? Our house, Benji. And having you in the way is exactly what I want. Oh, it's such a simple solution, Liz. And it took us 20 years to find it. Come on, dear. Here they are. Benji, the mayor's going to round up the city council. They'll kill that law within the hour. <laughs> they will if they want their dinner. <laughs> <laughs> well, I must say, you women put on a great show. The petitions were Dana's idea. Why, Dana, that makes me very grateful. Well, it was the least I could do, don't you think? It means a lot to Scott and me. We're back in business. I guess that fiancé of yours is due for a nasty shock. I suggest you give him this bottle of brandy, preferably over the head. But I haven't got a fiancé. I fired him this morning. No, Dana. Would you mind if your father kissed you? It's been a long time. Well, I'm glad you two finally got together. <laughs> and what about you two? Don't just stand there, Scott. Take her in your arms. Tell her you love her. You've been telling it to me for weeks. Go on now, both of you, before I catch pneumonia. Dana, Dana, I don't suppose you... Hush, darling, be still. After all, Father knows best. And so they lived happily ever after. Or until Benji got homesick for Paris. Something tells me Father wasn't built to stay put. Father was played this afternoon by Ed Jerome, well-known Broadway and radio character actor. Mr. Jerome has appeared recently on the New York stage in Deep Other Roots and Eastward in Eden. His most recent motion picture was The House on 92nd Street. Next week, we begin the new year and a new selection of widely varied plays with an Ellery Queen mystery drama called The Adventure of the Bad Boy. Arsenic is involved, and rabbits. Also, a magician, a fiddler, a deadly Hassenpfeffer, and a sorcerer's apprentice. Plus, of course, the elegant Ellery, his hard-boiled father, Inspector Queen, and Sergeant Veeley, who doesn't care for rabbits. The ungrammatical question, who done it? To which, in closing, we all add... Happy New Year. Father, Dear Father was written especially for the Ford Theater by Therese Lewis and Irving Pincus. Edited by Howard Teichman with continuity by George Faulkner. The musical score was written and conducted by Lynn Murray. The entire production was under the direction of George Zachary. Also appearing with Mr. Jerome were Bill Adams, Frank Behrens, Margaret Berlin, Alan Hewitt, Elsie Hitz, Fran Lafferty, Joe Latham, Helen Lewis, Charles Mendick, Daniel Ocko, Bert Parks, Gladys Thornton, and Evelyn Varden. The Ford Theater is presented by the Ford Motor Company, makers of Ford, Mercury, and Lincoln cars, and Ford trucks, tractors, and motor coaches. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. You have been listening to the Old Time Radio Hour, broadcast each week over the World Wide Web. You can subscribe at no charge through Apple Podcasts, Podbean, or RSS. Thank you so much for listening. We hope you can join us again next week for another hour of entertainment from the golden age of radio. Until then, this is your host, Justine Ward, saying so long for a while.